Hi, and welcome back to the wonderful world of the scientific hypothesis. My name is Brad Alger, and in today's video, we'll begin to address the important question of how science can make progress in its striving for true knowledge, the real truth, despite the enormous complexity of nature and the element of uncertainty that inevitably accompanies all of our conclusions. We'll look at a couple of competing visions for how this can be brought about, and we'll build on our fundamental notion of the scientific hypothesis to see why it plays such a crucial role in the process. By the end of the video, you'll have a better grasp of how the results of scientific investigations shape scientific reasoning, as well as why the principle of falsification is so vital to the quest for truth. Now it's time to begin looking at the important issue of how science makes progress. First, we'll have to see what it is that science is trying to do, and we'll look at a couple of main strategies for how it accomplishes or tries to accomplish its jobs. And finally, we'll look at the notion of facts in science and see what they really are and how we should think about them. So what are the main jobs of basic science? And first, notice that basic science used to be referred to as pure science, but you rarely hear that term nowadays. The main job of basic science is to discover new knowledge about nature, the truth about nature, where truth has a special meaning. It means true now and true forever and true everywhere. It's obviously an enormous and idealized goal that we can approach but never really achieve. The second job is to communicate the knowledge to the scientific community and society. Knowledge that is not communicated is pretty useless, and so this task is equally important to the task of discovery. We won't, however, have time to go into it in this video. Now, historically, there have been two main methods for discovering new knowledge. The first is inductive reasoning, also called induction. And this is where we attempt to extrapolate general rules from particular cases. In other words, we try to take a series of specific observations or experiments that we've made or know about from the past and project a rule into the future that will serve as a general principle of truth that will apply to cases that we haven't yet observed. The second method is hypothesis testing, and we'll consider that in more detail in the next slides. Now let's look at inductive reasoning to begin with. Here's a trivial example that you see in textbooks sometime. We'll see more uh, important cases later on. We're out in the world, we make observations, we see swans, these beautiful big white birds. We see many of them and we find that they're all white. The question is, can we induce a general truth that all swans are white? The question would be, in other words, how many swans would we have to see in order to be certain that they're all white? And the answer, of course, is all of them. We'd have to see all birds in the past, present, and future that were swans in order to answer the question of whether they're all white. This is clearly impossible. We can't do that. And therefore, we can't ever be certain that they're all white. So we can't get to a truth about the statement through inductive reasoning. So inductive reasoning is not a good method for discovering truth. This is one of its major shortcomings. This is not, however, to say that inductive reasoning has no place in science. It is an extremely good method, for example, for generating hypotheses, just not to getting to the ultimate goal of basic science. Now, if we turn back to the swans, we can ask a very different question. How many swans would we need to observe to conclude that not all swans are white? And the answer is pretty obvious. You'd have to see at least one bona fide example of a bird that was definitely a swan, that was definitely non-white, in order to conclude that not all swans were white. And this gives rise to the concept that rejection or falsification of a hypothesis is possible, whereas proof of the hypothesis is not. These considerations have important implications for how we should go about science. We should not specifically look for white swans because after all, that won't tell us very much that we don't already know. We should instead design experiments 
to look for black swans, things that might tend to disconfirm our hypotheses, because finding a black swan means that not all swans are white. Finding only white swans means that maybe they're all white. That would be our best guess at the moment, but we couldn't be sure of it. Now, these kinds of ideas led the philosopher Karl Popper to propose that the scientific process goes somewhat like this. We begin by proposing a hypothesis that we think might be true. Now, remember from the previous video that a hypothesis is not just some wild idea that strikes you, but it's a proposed explanation for some observations for some puzzle that you've discovered that you think needs to be explained. Once we have a hypothesis, we then test it severely to see if it might be false. If we don't succeed in falsifying it, what do we have left? Well, we have a hypothesis that we think may be true. Therefore, we test hypotheses not to show that they're true, but to see if they might be false so that we can avoid them. These considerations then give rise to a picture of science that looks somewhat like this. It takes in hypotheses of all different kinds regarding all sorts of things, subjects them to severe tests, and sorts them into bins of false and not false. What science knows then is our collection of tested and not falsified hypotheses. That is, of course, tested and not yet falsified hypotheses, because it's always possible that in the future we'll re-examine an established hypothesis, perhaps subject it to new tests, and find out that it's indeed false. This gives rise then to a picture of science as a continual investigation of nature and an establishment of hypotheses, explanations that are true as far as we know, but are always provisional. In later videos, we'll return to this general conception many times, and it'll form the basic foundation of our idea of science. Thanks for watching. Remember to give it a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to hear more. See you next time.